New Year's greetings to all of you. As we begin this new year, let me ask you a question. Are you yearning for the return of Jesus? Are you hoping this will be the year when He will appear in the heavens? If not, why not? Stay tuned for a discussion with two Bible prophecy experts who will give you six reasons why all Christians should be yearning for the soon return of Jesus. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. You know, folks, the writings of the early church fathers reveal that during the first 300 years of the church, Christians often prayed Maranatha. That is an Aramaic expression that means, Oh, Lord, come. The enthusiasm for the Lord's soon return, though, seemed to just wane out and die about 400 AD. And for most of Christendom, the desire has never been rekindled. Most Christians today seem to be yawning rather than yearning for the Lord's soon return. In a moment, I'm going to lead a discussion with some Bible prophecy teachers about why all of you who profess to be Christians should earnestly desire that this year will prove to be the year when the church will be raptured out of this world. But first, let me introduce you to our panel members. On the far end here is my colleague Nathan Jones. Nathan serves as the co-host of this program and he also serves as our web minister. Welcome Nathan. Happy New Year. Well, yeah, always good <laughs> to have you brother. And joining me here, this wonderful fellow right here is Dennis Pollack. Dennis is the founder and he is the director of Spirit of Grace Ministries, a ministry that focuses on proclaiming the gospel uh, throughout Africa. Dennis, it is always a blessing to have you on the program and welcome back. Well, thanks, Dave. It's an honor to be with you. Folks, we believe that the return of Jesus is going to occur in two stages. The first, which could occur any moment, is called the rapture. It will take place when Jesus appears in the heavens to take His church, both the living and the dead, out of this world. The second stage will be the second coming, when Jesus returns to this earth with His church to reign for a thousand years. Now, I believe most Christians are apathetic about the return of Jesus because they are ignorant of what is going to happen when He comes back. You know, I know that from personal experience because that was my case for many years. Think of it this way. How can you get excited about an event that you know nothing about? For example, how can you get all pent up with excitement about a surprise birthday party? You can't. It's a surprise. My personal apathy about the Lord's return rapidly dissipated when I discovered what is going to happen when Jesus returns to this earth. And I want to share with you six reasons why I am yearning for the Lord's soon return. The first is that I want to see Jesus receive what He has been promised, which is honor and glory and power. Amen. What about it, folks? Amen. Well, the last time the world saw Jesus, He was on a cross being crucified. Now, I'm not talking about the believers. They saw Him after His resurrection. But the last time the world saw Jesus, the, the ungodly, they, uh, it appeared that He had been totally defeated by His enemies. That's right. But when they see Him again at the glorious second coming, He will not be looking beaten or bloody or bruised or anything like that. He will come in glory. And there's an expression in the Bible that's used for the Lord's return that is not often used by the church. I find it interesting that in the Bible sometimes they use certain words that we just somehow have never grabbed hold of. But one of the words that is used for the Lord's return frequently in Scripture is the word revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, put your hope firmly upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The final book of the Bible is called the revelation, but not just a general revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So uh, that word means unveiled, revealed. Uh, he will be no longer hidden. Right now, you and I serve a master who we have never seen. And the world has written books about Jesus. They have painted paintings of what they thought He might look. But the truth is we've never seen Him. But on the day when He comes for the church at the rapture, we'll see Him. Yes. And then at the second coming, every eye will see Him. And He will be glorified. He will appear in glory. And I'm looking forward to that. Nathan? 
Oh, there's just some great verses in the Bible that explain this. I mean, Psalm 22, 27 through the one, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All of it. I mean, picture if that was what the world would be like today. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Even those who go down to the dust will kneel before him. I mean, the Lord will reveal to the whole world and all the nations will see it. And that's an exciting, victorious moment. And we share in that victory as Christians and heirs and co-heirs of Christ. Amen. Well, a second reason I want to see the Lord return is because Satan is going to receive what he deserves, which of course is total yes. defeat, dishonor, humiliation. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Crush him under his feet. What about it? Well, in, the, in, in my boyhood, the big thing on movies was cowboy movies and even television shows. Cowboy movies were big. Nowadays, it's superheroes. But oh, they yeah. had one thing in common, both in the cowboy movies and in the superhero movies of today. And that is they usually spend about the first half of the movie showing you how despicable the bad guy is. You get to the point where you hate him, you want to see him get crushed, you want to see him absolutely destroyed, and then in the second half usually the good guy begins to engage him and right. finally overcomes him. Well, in some ways that's like the history of this planet. We have seen the bad guy. Satan is the most cruel entity that there is in this universe, and he delights in misery, he delights, he has a good time when children are abused, when women are raped, when people die prematurely. He loves to see human misery. He is the ultimate bad guy. But the Bible tells us the good guy is coming. In fact, there's a place already reserved for the bad guy. Jesus said that hell, was, the lake of fire, was a place reserved, a place prepared for the devil and his angels. And it is at the coming of Christ that he will be dispatched placed in that pit for a thousand years, and then ultimately cast into the lake of fire. What about Nathan? You wanting to see Satan crush? Oh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 17 is a wonderful. We'll be with this, these. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms mm -hmm. tremble? He's going to be brought so low, and we will get to rejoice over that and see that. It's exciting. Uh, a third reason I want to see the Lord come back is because He's going to fulfill promises He's made to the creation. Yes. What would those be, Nathan? Well, the Bible, especially Romans 8, talks about that the, the creation is under bondage. We're under the curse. It's right. suffering just as much as we are. And if it had consciousness, which it doesn't, it would yearn too for the time that it would be redeemed. And that can only happen when the sons of God are revealed. We are the sons of God. Mm -hmm. We are the ones who will get our glorified bodies. The earth during the millennial kingdom of Christ will get, you could say, its glorified body in a way. The curse will be lifted it. We'll get to those verses, you know, where it talks about the lion eats straw and the wolf lies down with the lamb. A wonderful picturesque time period where the earth will be restored and then the internal state totally restored to what's called the new earth. Yeah. You know, I don't know whether global warming is a reality or not, but one thing I know, the world's got a bigger problem than global warming. <laughs> yes. And that is the problem of sin and decay that is all over our world. No matter what you are looking at, it will decay, it will grow old, it will eventually dissolve and, and be annihilated. And uh, the, our nature is in bondage to this process of decay, and it is only when Christ returns that that will be reversed. It's amazing that in the original uh, first few generations of man, you read the Bible, and these guys lived to be 900 years old. And then suddenly, after the flood and, and man had uh, done some damage to the earth and to himself, you look at the ages and they drop quickly down to 500, down to 400. Within, within a few generations you're down to where Abraham starts and, and then it was a big deal for him to have a baby at 100 years of age. Well, back in Noah's day and before that, that was no big deal at all to have a baby at 100 years of age. Those guys did it all the time. But uh, the, the, the very universe, the very earth itself, the process of, of our growth has all been corroded and, and uh, corrupted by the process of sin and decay. The whole of creation is in bondage to decay. Yeah. And that's part of the curse that came as a result of the sin in this world. And you know, uh, I find that most people are not aware of the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, He died not only to redeem mankind, but He died to redeem all of creation. Uh, this was indicated uh, in Old Testament times when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And this was a symbol that one day the Messiah would die, and through His blood, we would be able to cover the law of God and the demands of the law of God, and by grace we could be reconciled to God. But what most people ignore is it says He always stepped back and He sprinkled the blood on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that was a symbol that the, the blood of the Messiah would also make it possible for all of creation 
to be redeemed. God loves His, His creation. Yeah. When I was growing up in the church, I was taught that when the Lord came back, there would be the big explosion, the whole creation would cease to exist, and we would go off into a never, never world and exist as spiritual beings flat, floating around on a cloud playing a harp. But we wouldn't be tangible and have bodies and be on an earth. But the Bible teaches just the opposite. God loves His creation. He's going to redeem His creation. Uh, the original creation there were, there were no poisonous plants, no poisonous animals, no meat eating animals. That's all part of the curse. It says the lion will eat straw with the ox. It says a little boy will play in the, in the hole of the adder because the snake will no longer be poisonous. And I believe those are real promises that God is going to redeem and refresh and return this earth to what it was at the original time of the creation. Yeah. You know, Christians are not anti-environment. Some people have accused us of being, you know, well, we, we throw mm -hmm. our garbage out the car and we don't care about the environment. We do care and we should care. But we are realistic enough to know that this, the world and the environment will never be what it should be until Christ returns. I want to talk with you for just a moment about one of the most valuable Bible prophecy study aids that has ever been produced by this ministry. I'm speaking of this publication here called the Christ in Prophecy Study Guide. It took me seven years to produce this guide. It contains a summary presentation of every prophecy in the Bible concerning the first and second comings of the Messiah in both the Old and New Testaments. It begins with a detailed listing of 108 separate and distinct prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus during His first coming. The next section contains a listing of the first coming prophecies that are contained in the New Testament. Yes, you heard me correctly. We often forget that the Gospels present a lot of prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah. Most of these were given by Jesus Himself when He prophesied about His death, burial, and resurrection. The rest of the guide is devoted to the more than 500 prophecies concerning the Lord's second coming. The guide has several charts and diagrams like this one showing the prophetic significance of the Jewish feasts. Finally, the guide has two very detailed indexes. One is a topical index where you can find a listing of all the prophecies related to a particular topic like the rapture. The other is a scripture index that you can use to see where the book discusses specific verses. We normally sell the book for $15 plus $5 for the cost of mailing. Well, we want to begin this new year with a very special offer. We're going to make this study guide available to you for a donation of $12 or more. <laughs> you heard me right, a donation of $12 or more, and that includes the cost of mailing. I hope you will take advantage of this very special offer. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call the number you see on the screen during the times indicated. Ask for the Prophecy Study Guide, and we will send you a copy for a donation of $12 or more. Again, just call the number on the screen and ask for the Prophecy Study Guide. And as a bonus, we will send you a free copy of one of my most requested sermons, What Happens When You Die. This publication describes in detail what happens to a person the moment he or she dies, whether that person is a believer or an unbeliever. This publication will answer many questions you might have about life after death. And I believe that what it reveals from the Bible will serve as a source of great hope for you. Once again, just call the number you see on the screen and ask for the Prophecy Study Guide. I pray this guide will prove to be very beneficial to you in your study of God's prophetic Word. And now, let's return to our discussion. Okay, let's take a moment for review. We are discussing six reasons why Christians should desire the soon return of Jesus. And thus far, we have mentioned three. The first is that Jesus might receive what He has been promised, namely honor and glory and power over all the kingdoms of the earth. The second is that Satan might receive what he deserves, namely total defeat, dishonor, and humiliation. And the third is that the creation might receive what has been promised, namely regeneration and restoration and refreshment. A fourth reason that I would like to see Jesus return is because I want to see the nations receive what they have been promised, namely peace, righteousness, and justice. What about it, fellows? Amen. Well, the, in Psalm 2, the Father says to the Son, Ask me. <laughs> what a nice thing for the Father to say. Ask me, I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. Wow. And that is going to happen. The Bible not only says that Jesus inherits them, but we're going to have a part in all that inheritance. 
Yeah, and, and you mentioned Psalm 2. Right before that portion that you quoted, yeah. it says that all of the leaders of the world are in conspiracy against God and His Anointed One, shaking their hands at God and saying, who are you to tell us what we can do and what we cannot do? And then it says, while they're doing that, God <laughs> sits in the heavens and laughs, uh, because a day is coming when He's going to get it set all right. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that makes prophecy so exciting is that when you read this, and you say, you know what? I believe it's going to happen just like it says. It is thrilling. It's wonderful to think of Christ reigning over the nations. Uh, it's Isaiah 24 talks about the Lord will reign in Jerusalem before His elders gloriously. And now, of course, there's some that would say, well, that surely can't be. But what part of the Lord will reign in Jerusalem do you not understand? You know, the Lord <laughs> will reign in Jerusalem. And that's a thrilling thought that He's actually going to come to this earth. He said He would come again. He will do that. He will mm -hmm. reign gloriously over this earth, and He will be Lord. That's a problem I have with uh, our millennialists who tell me that Jesus is reigning right now. Yeah. He's reigning from heaven over all the nations of the world. Mm -hmm. And I always say, well, if He is, He is doing a terrible job of it oh. because every nation in the world is in rebellion against Him. Exactly. But what a day that's going to be when all the nations are truly subjected to Him. Nathan? Well, they haven't read Micah 4, which talks about all the nations. It says, nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Mm -hmm. Think if we took the economies. I mean, what is oh. it? You know, 50, 60 percent of our budget is, is put towards defense. Yeah. And we put that towards helping people and building and growing. And, and nobody's killing each other. We're not losing brothers and cousins and family members to Afghanistan and Iraq and all these other wars. No longer. What a world that would all be. All that money given to agricultural implements instead of war. <laughs> no, no needy, no poor, yeah. no food problems. What a day that will be. It's so pathetic. You know, as World War I was coming to a close, some of the leaders of the nation said, you know, we need some kind of an organization to make sure this never happens again. And they came up with the League of Nations. Yeah. And uh, that obviously didn't work too well. World <laughs> War II came along. And <laughs> as that war was coming to an end, yeah. some of the leaders, including Roosevelt and some others, said, you know, we need a new organization, and this one will make sure that it doesn't happen again. And that was the United Nations. Well, we can see how that has worked out. But Jesus Christ will come, and there will be that peace. That Only when the Prince of for, Peace comes. When the Prince of Peace comes. Okay, a fifth reason that I want to see Jesus return is because I want to see Israel receive what they have been promised. What's that? Amen. They have been <laughs> promised uh, two major blessings. One, and the greatest blessing really, Amen. is that they would serve God from their hearts. You know, people like to say uh, Israel is a hard-hearted people and, you know, God has washed His hands of them. But God has made some amazing promises. I wanted to read a scripture from Ezekiel. And this is a scripture that is often used uh, to uh, apply to Christians. And they say, well, when you got born again, this is what happened to you. Now, that is true, but it was first promised to the Jews. God says to the Jews, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll take out your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you. He says, I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll keep my judgments. You will do them. Now, God always keeps his promise. This does not depend on whether Israel does this or that. God is going to do that. So he has promised that and he will reign. Christ will come, will reign over an obedient Jewish people, but not only obedient, but they will be raised up to a place of primacy in the world. Before Christ ascended, his disciples asked him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's very interesting what he didn't say. He didn't say, well, that's a stupid question. Why in the world would you <laughs> ever be to the think? church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He just said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. This is going to happen. So he was indirectly saying, it, it will happen, but you don't need to know that right now. So there will be a time when they will be restored to a place of prominence in the earth. This persecuted people, people who have been hated, despised like no other people, will be raised up. God always keeps His promises. You and I have done uh, various projects that we have just gotten tired of. At least I have. I don't know about you, but you probably have. And you just put them on a shelf and you never finish them. God's not that way. When God starts a project, He will finish it. And Israel is His project. What He has said He will do, He will do. Nathan, anything about Israel you want to add? Well, I think it's exciting. Zechariah 8.23, In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hand of the robe and say, Let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. Boy, what a promise. Amen. <laughs> and he sees how secular... Today the Jew is the object of, of jokes and hatred and persecution, but in that day and time, 
when the Jews are elevated as the prime nation of the world, everyone will want to walk with a Jew. And like Dennis said, the important difference is they will love the Lord Jesus as their Savior. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, in Old Testament times, they always ran to Egypt every time they got in trouble. Today they run the United States. But it, we are seeing the prophecies say that in the end times all nations will come against Israel, which includes the United States. And we've seen our nation turn against Israel. Yeah. A day will come when there was nobody to turn to. At the end of the tribulation, the remnant that's left will finally turn their hearts to God. And they will cry out, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord will come. <laughs> and He will gather those believing Jews in a third regathering. We've had the regathering from Babylon, the regathering in unbelief going on now, and a regathering in belief. Mm. And they will be established as a prime nation of the world. And all the blessings of the Lord will flow through the Jewish people yeah. to all the earth. What a day that will be. Amen. Well, that brings up to a sixth reason why we should all be yearning for the coming of the Lord. And that has to do with all of us. And that is some promises God's going to fulfill regarding the church. What are those? Yeah. Well, He has promised us, number one, eternal life. Number two, we would reign with Christ on the earth. And ultimately, we would reign with Christ forever. And again, He always keeps His promises. When Christ returns, we are going to be given uh, a reign with Jesus Christ. Are over you going to be a mayor or governor? Or what? <laughs> well, I haven't yet decided. I thought I might be talking with the Lord about just you know where I would best fit in. But on the other hand, he may have his own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he said that's going to be some of the degrees of reward yeah. based upon our works in the in the kingdom now. Uh, that some would be put over one city and yeah. one over two and one over five or whatever. Yeah. And he the, said, I'll, "You've been faithful in a few things. Yeah. I'll make you ruler." over many things. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, heaven, that's where you, you play the harp, you sit on the cloud, and if you're lucky, someone comes over to your cloud and enjoys a little harp time, a duet, you know, with you. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say we'll play harps forever, and it doesn't say we'll sing forever. It says we will reign with Jesus Christ forever. One of the things I'm really looking forward to that's a promise to the church is that we're going to receive glorified bodies, and I'm ready for mine. <laughs> I really well, I don't know why, Dave. You've got such a magnificent... Yeah, all that energy. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, my, my left knee uh, hurts every time I take a step, you know, uh. or arthritis and all that sort of thing. And I'm just looking for that day when there's not going to be any of those pains, and I'm going to have that glorified body. And I, I, I could just hardly wait. The Lord has made so many, many wonderful promises uh, to both Israel and to the church. And we don't need to claim their promises, and they don't need to claim ours. He's going to fulfill all these promises. And He's gotten so specific. You know, when you look at Revelation, He describes this new Jerusalem that will be our home in eternity. And He gives uh, all kinds of details about it. We know it will be made of a transparent gold. We know there will be gems. The gates will be made of pearl. We actually know the dimensions of it, around 1,500 uh, square miles and then 1,500 miles high. Uh, these are, are truths. These are God saying to His people, hang in there. You may not be doing too well right now. You may be living in some little shack, but I have something amazing for you, and I'm going to give it to you. And He always keeps His word. Praise the Lord. Well, gentlemen, we just about exhausted our time for this program. And as we bring it to a close, I want to ask you, do you have any personal reasons why you are desiring the Lord's return in this year? Nathan, how about you? Well, for me, it, it hits close to home. My elementary age son, Zachary, has autism. And, you know, he still can't talk. He'll never be able to do the things a normal boy will do. He'll grow up and be an adult. There's no cure for it. And the promise of having the glorified bodies... I know when I go up to heaven one day that my son Zachary will be whole again right, and the whole of the millions of people in heaven will be celebrating and glorifying God for that transformation. That's the day I live for. Wow, Amen. that is wonderful. How about you, Dennis? Well, there are so many reasons, but one reason that I sometimes think of that might be a little unusual, but you know... When you get born again, your love for Jesus is so strong and there's a euphoria and you just feel like all you want to do is live in His presence. And then you come down to earth <laughs> and you find you still have this nature that wants to say the wrong thing, do mm. the wrong thing, wants the wrong thing. And you realize there's these two natures in you at war with one another. And you never feel quite comfortable because no matter how spiritual you can get. Dave, I have been sometimes in the most anointed spiritual states 
and suddenly the flesh will just put a thought in my mind or an urge, and I'll think, where did that even come from? And when Christ comes and gives us our new body, He's going to do a, an extraction, and He's going to take out that sin nature, yeah. and we are going to serve Him in purity without that ugly, sinful nature. Boy, that I tell have. you, I, I agree. And I, you know, uh, Nathan, I have a, a grandson uh, who uh, is afflicted and doesn't know who he is, who I am. Uh, uh, you can't hold him. You can't touch him. He can't have a haircut without being put to sleep. I've dedicated two books to him because he's a constant reminder to me that we live in a fallen world where the innocent suffer. And I look forward to that day when Jason will be able to talk with me, when I'll be able to throw a football to him, when we'll be able to uh, have fellowship with one another. And that's going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. I look forward to reunion with family members, uh, church members who've gone on before me, Bible characters. I can hardly wait to meet David. I, and to have David lead a worship service. Boy, that will be something. Or have John. Sit, uh, can you imagine sitting in a Bible study where John is teaching the book of John? Oh, so many wonderful things that I, I look forward to. Folks, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Folks, only a Christian can look death in the face and sneer at it with such words. And that's because our Savior, Jesus, has conquered death. And He has promised that those who put their faith in Him will also overcome death. Here's how He put it in 1 John eleven twenty five. 25. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me shall live even if he dies. Then it's Tell our viewers how they can be assured of eternal life. Certainly, Dave. Folks, all the religions of the world except Christianity teach that you must earn your salvation through good works. Only Christianity teaches that salvation through good works is impossible. Sinners cannot justify themselves to a perfect and holy God. But Jesus was sinless. He died in our place as an atonement for our sins. All you have to do to receive that atonement is to place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you can do that by praying a simple prayer, confessing to God that you are a sinner and that you're sorry for your sins and that you desire to receive Jesus as your Savior. Salvation is a free gift of God through faith in Jesus. It is not something you can earn. And if you decide to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me urge you to seek out a Bible-believing church where you can make a public profession of your faith in Jesus. Submit yourself to water baptism and start growing in the faith. Well, that's our program for this week, folks. But before we close, I want to invite you to begin this new year with us by becoming a Prophecy Partner. Our Prophecy Partners provide the financial foundation of our ministry, and they also serve as our prayer partners. To become a Prophecy Partner, all you have to do is make a commitment to donate $20 or more per month for one year. And in return, I'll send you a letter each month providing you with an update on the ministry. You'll also receive a monthly gift, of usually a DVD with a video program about some aspect of Bible prophecy. And speaking of prophecy partners, Nathan and I are wearing ties that were given to us by two of our prophecy partners in Australia, Deb and Benjamin Moore. These ties feature designs by Australian Aborigines. Again, I want to wish you a blessed New Year in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for being with us this week. I hope our program has been a blessing to you. Until next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.